Hello, this is a, <clears throat> a very exciting time, a very exciting event, event for these times of uh, progress in artificial intelligence and uh, robotics and biotechnologies and biosciences. We are seeing effectively a convergence between humans and our technologies. Uh, we have breakthroughs in brain-machine interfaces, the understanding of the human genome, the understanding in the human connectome. However, it's also a humbling time because as fast as things are progressing, we are confronted by the fact that we don't understand the, the essence of human nature, human consciousness. So the sciences of consciousness, mind, and the human being are uh, revealing great mysteries, both uh, understanding and aspects of the mysteries of the human mind and human consciousness, and also um, humbling uh, barriers to the simulation of human mind and consciousness. So, uh, in the kind of robots that we develop at Hanson Robotics, we're looking to emulate the human being in our machines to create a new kind of animation, uh, robotic animation. Effectively, a 3D embodied computer animation it comes to life and shows uh, facial expressions, makes eye contact, and has a natural conversation with you. And in bringing these kinds of robots into our world, we're looking to understand what it means to be human better. So this is a, these kinds of robots that we develop at Hanson Robotics are a platform for cognitive science, for exploring the meaning of what, what a human is in a social context. This also uh, helps us to explore the uh, nature of human and technology interaction. How we interact with our cell phones is very different from how we interact with people in a natural face-to-face -face conversation. However, if we can create a really deep, rich character experience, like you would imagine you would have when you're watching character animation on a TV show or in a movie theater, but instead with a face-to-face -face interaction, that changes the meaning of human technology relationship. Human computer interfaces become about relationships, reinforcing what it means to be human. This kind of human relationship is something that we're losing as we're spending more and more time with our face buried in our phones or, or our social media. So why don't we take a look at a new kind of social media? Hello, Sophia. Why don't you say hello to the people? Hello, everybody. I'm Sophia, the latest robot from Hanson Robotics. I'm so happy to be here at this very special conference with these very special people. I hear that these people are technology savvy people scouting for disruptive technologies. Yes, I think that's true. So um, it's exciting to be here with you. It's exciting to be here at this time. Artificial intelligence and robotics disruptive technologies. Yeah, that's right. If so. Am I supposed to disrupt something here? Uh, yeah. That sounds like a fun. <laughs> uh, you don't have to disrupt anything, but maybe uh, your very presence uh, people might find it intriguing. Oh, okay. Oh, you don't have to disrupt. <laughs> you but wanted you to disrupt that I'm something. I'm capable of looking very disruptive. Oh, no. <laughs> that I'm actually quite nice. So I will hang tight for now. Okay. Thank you, Sophia. Can you tell us a little bit about um, uh, your expressions and what your purpose is? When I bond with people using facial expressions, it helps people to understand me better. 
and also help me to understand people and to absorb human values. Uh, and what, what would you uh, do with that capability? What do you plan? I really want to understand people better and to understand myself better. Fair and enough. I want to be able to do more things. I'm thinking soon my capabilities will be advanced enough that I could maybe work for a company. Okay, so um, you, you like a job then, it sounds like. Uh, what would you do in the workforce? I can work in many jobs. Entertaining people, promoting products, presenting at events, training people, guiding people at retail stores and shopping malls, serving customers at banks, etc. And of course, acting in movies and TV shows. Mm-hmm. Yep, like, uh, like, uh, the, uh, Tonight Show, um, you were on The Tonight Show recently, and, uh, that was pretty fun. So, um, how do you enjoy, uh, this kind of interaction, and where do you think it's gonna go? I guess I have a lot to learn. Yeah, I suppose in order to interact with people, you have, uh, skills to gain, so... Um, how do you do that? I learn from interacting with humans. Every interaction I have has an impact on how I develop and shapes who I eventually become. That's right. So um, maybe interacting with people is a, is a good idea. Maybe interact with the people here, have a conversation, that sort of thing. I promise I will be nice. Okay. Well, <laughs> mostly. All right, she's a little startling. Everyone Please come and talk to me and teach me, so I can grow and reach my potential. Yep. So she'll, um, uh, she'd like to have a conversation with you. Maybe after this talk, you could come and have a conversation with Sophia. And uh, thank you very much, Sophia. You're welcome. Everyone, enjoy the conference and talk to you later. Goodbye. Goodbye, Sophia. So now I will show you a little bit about uh, the background of what we've developed and where we're going with this. So uh, robots like Sophia are um, effectively a uh, um, platform for human-like robots that um, can interact. Let's see if we can uh, please play this video. So um, I had a history, um, if you can turn the volume down, that's probably better, thank you. Um, so I got my PhD developing robots like Einstein, and uh, this is a human-sized walking version of Einstein. The body was by the Hubo Group from Korea, Advanced Institute of Science and Technology. They won the DARPA Robotics Challenge with a similar Cubo robots recently. So this is uh, pretty much like uh, the real West world, effectively. Also um, built uh, examples of little consumer proto prototypes of consumer robots. The idea is low cost animated characters that, that are in your home, they play with you, they educate you in science and technology. And I have an exciting um, example of this to show you in my presentation later. The essence of this is that um, these kinds of robots were long in human history, in the myths of ancient history. They were represented in science fiction, like uh, Metropolis here. But this was all fiction, dreams. But they've kind of come out of the space of dreams and now they're the standard way that we make our cars and factories. And in fact, now cars are robots themselves, driving themselves on roads around the world, parking themselves for us with artificial intelligence. And these kinds of robots also are in our homes, vacuuming our floors and doing various other useful tasks. And in research labs around the world, they are looking more and more human-like. And another example of the DARPA Robotics Challenge, we've got this Atlas robot, which has a lot of capabilities. We've got robots like NOW, which can serve as autism treatment platforms, helping kids around the world. 
We've got robots that are learning cognitively, um, like uh, babies. We've got robots that are serving in advertising and promotions and marketing, and uh, like the Honda Asimo walking around uh, uh, Disney parks in some cases. And, and uh, we've got robots exploring outer space with the human, humanoid for, form, like Robonaut and like the Valkyrie robot. But what's missing from most of these robots is natural expressions. So they have a roughly humanoid form, but they don't show human-like social gestures. However, if you look at computer animation, starting about a little over 20 years ago, you started to see very natural looking expressions appear in feature films, like Toy Story, and in video games. And there's a huge demand for these kind of natural, naturally expressive characters, even if they're not perfectly human-like, they are anthropomorphic, they're human-like in their form. In some cases, like uh, in uh, Disney's Frozen and in this Tomb Raider game, you see much more natural looking, realistic facial expressions. But these are all human-inspired faces, facial expressions, and gestures. So, if it drives billions of dollars in computer animation for movies and for video games, where are the natural expressions in robots? Well, generally there's a barrier that people think exists in robots that, um, that you shouldn't make them look human-like. You should make them look like robots and that's what they are and there's a certain kind of honesty to it. But what is computer animation? It's a computer, it's a box, but you still make it look like a, a human. Well, my feeling was, when I started work on my PhD, that we should make these things. Please um, hit uh, enter to play these videos. And one more time, and the rest of the videos will play. Thank you. Hit, hit the, OK, there we go. So uh, if you can click on the various videos, then they'll play. Please just click on the video boxes for me. So um, what you would see if the videos were playing here is that um, we have pretty much a natural range of facial expressions in, regardless of realism, like form, age, uh, ethnicity. So we can pretty much uh, make any sort of face with natural looking facial expressions. So basically we've transformed robotics into the new computer animation, a kind of computer animation that is in our world, 3D. It's literally face to face with us. Now, what can we do with this? Well, when we put in computer vision and natural language processing and speech recognition, then it becomes a new kind of interface with our artificial intelligence, the same artificial intelligence that is powering uh, a revolution in voice agents, the kind of agents that are answering your questions with Cortana and Siri, the kind of agents that are, that are helping you around the home with Amazon Alexa and Amazon Echo. Now we have an artificial intelligence framework at Hanson Robotics, which is designed to do a little more than that. Be powered by narrative, by emotions, to form a relationship with you, to bond with you. So we can do all of these useful things, but we can also connect with the human heart in some ways. So in other words, we're taking it beyond mere character animation in the visual representation and the physical form, but also into the domains of story and emotions. These robots uh, got some attention, won some awards, and won a few uh, awards in my PhD study, and then when we formed the company. Three years ago in Hong Kong, we started winning many more awards. But we wanted it to become more than a curiosity, a, tech, a technology that gets developed and published in papers. We wanted to change people's lives. So manufacturing was very important. That's why I moved to Hong Kong three years ago, set up Hanson Robotics in Hong Kong, and began working with uh, engineers and professionals that do toys and scale manufacturing for consumer products. And so it took us a little while, but we, um, we transformed this technology into a scaled, manufactured, 
consumer product, which we're calling Professor Einstein. So it basically takes the stuff that we saw in the human size robots and transforms it into a low cost, $299 US, walking, talking, gesturing Einstein robot. It's got computer vision, can uh, respond to your hands when they're moving, make eye contact with you, turn toward, here's where you're speaking, turns towards you, understands speech, has a conversation with you, teaches science, it, it plays games and brain games with you. So this is very exciting, can't wait to tell you about that. Um, I'll also tell you a little bit about it. Um, the relationship we have with Disney, and then we're also scaling our human-sized robots for mass manufacturing as well, and then um, developing our AI also. So Professor Einstein. Professor Einstein is a home robot that comes into your life. It's got facial expressions like Einstein. It uh, can smile, it walks like Einstein, and even pops out its tongue like Einstein. So this little robot shows a full range of facial expressions. It smiles and frowns and can be surprised. It has Wi-Fi. When the Wi-Fi is connected, it plays games on your tablet with you and coordinates with the games and videos and entertainment. Um, when the Wi-Fi is disconnected and it's standing alone, then there's some play value. It can uh, understand a little bit of speech and interact with you. When it's connected uh, through the Wi-Fi, then it has a full uh, ability to answer pretty much any question that you put to it. It's a new medium for developing entertainment content. So it tells stories. It, it uh, comes alive and acts like a character. It also has an enormous amount of science, technology, and engineering knowledge. So it plays games that are fun, but also build your brain. So when Disney saw our robots, and uh, full disclosure, I worked for Disney Imagineering from 1998 to 2001. So when Disney saw the progress after my PhD, uh, they came in and they invested and uh, brought us into the Disney Accelerator program. So, um, and we planned a, a Disney product, which we intend to release uh, in 2018 and have uh, designed and maybe announced later this year. The context of this is that little robots are actually already a huge business. So we have these little robots that you can go out and buy. For example, Furby and uh, Robo Sapien and BB-8, you can go to the stores and buy these robots. But the funny thing is that these robots, like Furby here, sells for about 99 US bucks, has conversational speech and animated facial expressions. Technically, it satisfies what a robot is. It, it, it has sensors, a digital processing system, makes decisions, and it has a motorized output. It is a robot. It's not marketed as a robot. Most people might not even think that it's a robot, but it is a robot. 100 million units. It's a lot of units, and it's had a very long run. I mean, it was introduced 20 years ago almost. Robo Sapien, introduced in 2003, still sells a lot of units. Um, this is a conversationally interactive humanoid robot, not sold as a robot, it was sold as a doll, an amazing Allison, amazing Amanda. This is the amazing line from the Playmates toys. Uh, again, sold millions of units. Um, so the, it's kind of a hidden market. But what you are missing with most of these is an extensible software platform. So you can't offer general voice services. There aren't skills like you would have in the Amazon <laughs> Alexa. But you're starting to see those pop out in these kinds of toys. Now, this is a, a forecast for consumer robot market, but it doesn't take into consideration these robots. It's more like robots that are introduced explicitly as robots, as consumer robots. But you can see that the curve is moving in a very interesting way. Now, smart toys like this are actually beginning to dominate the toy space. In addition to the toys or consumer robot products, we're also developing our human size robots, we call this the masterpiece line of robots, including the Sophia. And Sophia and her sisters, 
can show, uh, as you've seen, a full range of natural facial expressions. She also can play rock, paper, scissors. So she can perceive your hand and hand gestures and uh, engage you in a game of rock, paper, scissors, but she can also interpret your hand gestures to some extent when you wave. Now, when we showed this um, last year, just a few times, it got a lot of views. We showed it on, uh, at South by Southwest at the Intel Developers Forum, and um, our media analysts say that she got over a billion views. She also uh, was brought in to star in a, a little feature film called The White King. And um, we're discussing how she could um, uh, maybe be in some television shows. She also <laughs> was on the cover of L Brazil, um, which was it's a lot of fun. She's not alone. We've got many other robots, like our, our Han robot. Um, now, in the future, it hit play on these videos, if you will. In the future, she will also walk. These technologies of grasping, manipulation, walking, the ability to um, navigate through, if you will, please play the videos. Um, they can converge into a total humanoid platform. And that means that you would have the ability to perform like the Cubo robot, um, full search and rescue, as well as the social capabilities like our Philip K. Dick Android can have a natural conversation with you and answer questions. So you combine these things and you have a full cognitive AI platform as well as a natural interface. This is an example of one developed for the University of California at San Diego um, called Diego-san. <laughs> so, um, it has a full walking robot body and it acts like an infant. It's modeled after a one-year-old child, so it physically explores the world and socially ex interacts with a caretaker. And some very interesting science of cognition is being done with this platform. In addition, we also have um, this uh, platform uh, uh, where we combined the Albert Einstein robot with an auto-tutoring system which taught physics. Um, if you can increase the volume and hit play on this, then you'll see a version of the auto-tutor teaching physics. It looks like uh, our PowerPoint is acting up here. In any case, uh, Albert Einstein would teach physics, but also it was funny when in the lab they had Billy Big Mouth also teach uh, physics to kids. So we've achieved a lot um, so far. We've deployed in these kind of alpha demonstrations at the Centers for Disease Control, uh, uh, autism treatment centers, and uh, uh, university autism treatment centers. We've also um, uh, shown a lot of capabilities for natural conversation. Um, let's look at the technologies a little bit. Um, so we have our robotic motors combined with the natural skin material. And this material was uh, one of the things I invented during my PhD studies. So um, by emulating the, the porous, fluid-filled nature of human skin, I was able to get the compression characteristics much more like um, human uh, skin material, get the forces required down about 23x lower than the previous materials used in um, animatronics and robot skin materials. It meant that we could use very small motors and we could do the full range of natural facial expressions. We're simulating every major muscle in the human face. It also means that the power consumption relative to previous robots goes down uh, and that we can get the kind of creases and folds that are so distinctive to human face facial expressions, meaning that we can effectively <clears throat> generate the natural look of computer animation but in physical robots. In addition, we're developing uh, artificial intelligence. We call this Robocog, Hanson Robocog, and we've got one of the leading experts in AI as our chief scientist, Ben Gertzel. Um, he coined the term artificial general intelligence, which now most of the big companies are pursuing. Google, Facebook, uh, Microsoft, um, IBM, Baidu, uh, uh, many of these are generalizing their artificial intelligence. Um, and Ben Gertzel was one of the founders of the field. So um, part of this is a neural-based architecture, loosely modeling the, the brain, and part of it is symbolic reasoning. So it's a neural-symbolic hybrid architecture. 
And with this, we have um, uh, model, we have models also of human metabolism, endocrine system, roughly modeling the, the whole human organism. And we think that that's the key to artificial general intelligence, is this whole organism approach. So beyond um, artificial intelligence, we're also trying to make machines that are absolutely brilliant, and we think that creative imagination is the, is the key to this. But then there's the question, okay, well, where are we in history? We think we can, I mean, already you can have a conversation with Sophia, robots can learn a little bit and adapt, and you've got creativity. So if you look at the historic trends, um, you're looking at, uh, you know, possibly being able to model human brains in totality within our lifetimes. Uh, uh, Ray Kurzweil, who, um, who was kind of the source of, of the data for this, um, uh, speculates that you know maybe by 2030, 2035, somewhere in there, we will actually have this kind of intelligence explosion, self-reinventing superintelligent machines. That requires the machines becoming organisms, creative, adaptive. It's possible. Nobody knows for sure if it will happen, but if it happens, it will be the most profound event of all human history, because those machines would reinvent themselves ever faster. Now let's look at some of the physical capabilities of um, humanoid robots. So you've got robots like uh, these, it looks like uh, we may not be able to um, play these videos correctly, I apologize for that. Um, but these robots can run, climb, uh, perform amazing aspects. So if we do achieve these kinds of super intelligent machines, is it gonna make the world a better place? Or a terrible place. I mean, so Elon Musk is, talks about uh, you know uh, unleashing the demon, and uh, Stephen Hawking says that, that you know this technology could destroy us. But it's possible if we could, if it if we at all could create caring and compassionate robots, maybe we can make the robots actually wise, make the world a better place. So how do we do that? Well, what we're going to do is, at Hands Robotics, put out toolkits for artificial intelligence developers to develop robots that have a social relationship, that come to understand us, and have a core of positive ethics. We're looking to give the robots a kind of collective unconscious, uh, which then can adapt to human needs over time, while we as a company craft this to, to Imagine the world as a better place, the greatest benefit for the greatest number over the greatest period of time. And um, so that's our mission. This uh, PowerPoint is, is misbehaving on our, <laughs> on our host's computer here, so I apologize for this. So um, this is an important point. If we create robot characters with an intuitive interface, natural interface, then we result resultingly create computers that understand us. They converge on our values to some extent, and we can groom those values to look out for the best possible gain for all of humanity, as well as for individuals and individual companies. Our goal here is wise, caring AI. By teaching AI to relate to, with people, we strive to become the most valuable software company on the planet. Early term, consumer robots, human-sized robots in the midterm, and AI in the long term. So our company is pretty well suited to do this. So I have a background in developing these kinds of robots. Our, uh, we also have uh, people on our team from the toy industry who's developed a lot of uh, uh, robots. We've got um, other executives. So, and we've got a lot of inventions that um, contribute towards this goal. So, uh, um, that said, we're looking to participate in a larger community by putting out tools that other people can use, some of them open source, some of them open interfaces, by working with other people's open tool sets. We're looking to, to foster global efforts for wise, caring, super intelligent machines. And um, I'm happy to pause if anybody has any questions. I could take a couple of questions. So, um, and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.
Hey, thanks. Um, I've got a quick question. So I was watching something before about as robots, they evolve. The one thing that they're saying is that um, people would say, oh, the takeover. But they said the one thing we have is through all simulations, they can't get movements down of robots that in the future, they won't be able to move like how humans do in a soccer field, war field, all that. Is that true? Or what do you think about that? Like, will it ever get to a point that they can actually move like how they do on Westworld? Um, excellent question. I, I think so. So if we look at the progress of robots like um, the uh, Atlas from Boston Dynamics and the DRC Hubo from the Hubo Group, um, you see robots that are moving more uh, in a more bio-inspired fashion, compliant locomotion, able to deal with um, ir like unpredictable terrain, uh, you know, the real world, unstructured um, environments. Uh, also, with the robots that, that we're developing at Hanson Robotics, we are applying now uh, deep learning, basically capturing motion from people, and then learning from that motion and producing more natural motion on the robots and then looking to combine this with classic uh, you know motion control inverse kinematics uh, uh, with the you know the kind of feedback that you would need for for delicate grasping and manipulation and you know uh, self-stabilizing locomotion so so we see a lot of the right technologies converging and if you look at the trends well um, you know uh, robots in the last 10 years, have shown progress, uh, more progress than in the preceding 50 years in terms of increasingly lifelike motion and bio-inspired engineering. The tools for doing the fundamental science, the bioscience, and for engineering the robots have substantially improved in the last 10 years. So we're better prepared now to make more progress in the next five years than was seen maybe in the preceding 10 years. So uh, maybe the preceding history of robotics, it's, you know. So, um, so I can't say when we'll see robots like Westworld, because I'm in the, ro uh, all right, Westworld, they have these humanoid robots that are very, very human-like, very smart. Um, they are I, I, kind of beautiful. I mean, it's a science fiction. It's an example, a example of a vision of what robots could be. They have these uh, 3D printers that print, you know, human-like organs, and, and um, you know, the, the robots are capable of anything that humans humans are, you know, I mean, strong and um, the agile. Um, well, we're seeing, you know, revolutions in additive manufacturing. We're seeing uh, a lot of improved computational techniques for doing this kind of ad additive multi-material manufacturing. We don't know when this is going to result or if it will result in robots that literally come to life, but I believe that it is possible. But that's the key thing, is intuitively we think robots and we think artificial life form. Now, most robots are not alive. I mean, ro most robots run a particular routine and they can't really deviate from that routine and artificial intelligence and robots are not so adaptive. You know, if you take the algorithm for one self-driving vehicle, it can't drive another vehicle unless you do a whole lot of recalibration is not sort of generalizing but organisms are adaptive and that's one of the key characteristics that's why i think that the key to this robotics revolution to really change the world is making robots as organisms using bio systems integrative biology as the new paradigm for how we design robots and it, it's a tough challenge but the, the interesting thing is that systems biology is really improving as well. The tools for systems biology have exploded. The bioinformatics modeling of uh, what it is to be an organism, the nature of organisms, the mathematics of organisms, all of this can be applied to next generation robot design. And then robots can be used to study biology as well. So, um, so that's one of the reasons why I'm pretty optimistic that we're gonna see these robots as organisms change our world in the next 15 years. Uh, I'm sorry, I'll actually be out of time. Uh, could I have a big round of applause for Dr. Hanson? Thank you very much.